hands are ready. Well, I recognize you. I was good at it. You're a Okay. Okay, you're the boss. You're so cute. You can boss me around oh anytime you want. <laughs> She's a regular <laughs> talent. I love it. I love it. Um, maybe it was worth coming up to the booth. <laughs> um, okay. Well, if she wants to see the booth, she just see the Arctic Circle. That's, uh, that's what I uh, So, we've got a full schedule. Everything that... Uh, that I wrote down is probably not really what's happening. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, change, it's changing by the moment. Because the schedule is useless here because we have so much free time. You can't control what we do by a schedule. Okay, all right. We're moving time. He's got a very wise man. He's got a big mouth. He's got a big mouth. So according to this, so we're going to uh, start with Anthony, which I didn't mean for you to start, but you ready to go, Anthony? Yay! Yeah. 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 Laura wants to sit down and enjoy your performance. Oh, we're going to have to walk across this has arrived. <laughs> New York City streets are easier, let me tell you. Oh, and it's not cushion. Oh, well, I'll make do. It's unadaptable. I'm sorry if I'm blocking you. you know, the intelligent head and the big mouth. <laughs> Wait, no, I have a question. Are you doing something? This is it, baby. You got it. You do something else.
okay anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Uh, Bonnie something? No. No. Oh. And that was uh, if I had a hammer. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't I mean, I wasn't on the list until like two hours ago. Oh, 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 oh. I got a couple more, actually. Oh, Grace has a couple more. But you guys really try a little harder to name that tune. And like you did with Amazing Grace, sing out. Is that all right with you, Maestro? Yeah, that's great. So don't, don't compete with each other. <laughs> I, I hate to get, I hate for things to get ugly. <laughs>
so many people here that I recognize as denizens uh, of that den. Let's um, face it, that means he knows what we look like. <laughs> 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 those who haven't heard it in a while. <coughs> so, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, my people, that way I can decide which key to sing in. I know which key my voice was ready to sing in in the morning. <laughs> uh, start there. <laughs> but who, who knows what, for a couple of people. 
course, as a bottle of the news will do. <laughs> That's not the bottom of the news you think of the guitar, I think. <laughs> Racial justice, or corporate neglect, or perhaps Nicaragua, or exploring your chakras, and also politically very correct. So it comes as a shock that these this camp people flock to to talk to their blue about virtue and truth. Wouldn't board up and lock that file den near the dock. That's debauching our elders and corrupting our youth. Yes, the sauna. In the sauna, take your seat in the heat by the flame. Once you've gone and taken sauna, Life will never again be the same. Where thermometers measure the heights of our pleasure, so perversely we treasure this pain. But the curious fauna that dwell in the sauna return there again and again. Leave the fins now to Anna for inventing the sauna where they go to keep body and soul clean and well. Where the macho, macho compete for an upper bench seat <laughs> further closer to heaven and hotter than hell. There they sit and they sweat as it's hotter they get. Till it's time to escape and go jump in the lake where they scream and they swear about how cold it is there. So they go back inside and start over to bake. Sauna, in the sauna, slowly stew in the new by the flame. Once you've gone and taken sauna, life will never again be the same. By all logic, it seems that such thermal extremes would only deal like the insane. But those heat-happy fauna 
that to dwell in the sauna, they return there again and again. Old King Cole with his pipe and his bowl. Brother Ralph claims his throne and begins holding court. There's no clothes on at all and his back to the wall. While his courtiers and courtesans kvetch and cavort. Then adjusting his punch, oh, the good king will launch into telling bad jokes, both off color and lame. But his subjects don't mind, cause you see, Ralph is blind, and for him they suppose every color's the same, the song, in the song, glad and all bare asked by the flame. And the taken song, life will never again be the same. Where we all sing along to those great movement songs, though we only recall the refrain. So those discordant fauna that dwell in the sauna, they sing them again and again. <laughs> As the experts not knowing what treatment to pick. Well, a hotline's no use, it just feeds the abuse. And cold showers were tried, and they failed, you can bet. And the shrinks all refused to have their couches used by some stark naked body all covered with sweat. In the sauna, slide beside some wet hide by the flame. Once you've gone and taken sauna, life will never again be the same. Now physicians agree, just like too much TV, too much sauna will melt down your brain. But those thermal path fauna that dwell in the sauna return there again and again. When we pause from our break and look up from the lake, and ten thousand bright stars fill the heavens on high, or the waves catch the moon, or the cry of a loon fills our hearts with such joy that we know when we die that these glories we share must be like those up there when we're called to the gates of that great rendezvous. And if not, we're insured with the heat we've endured. We're prepared very well for that other place to buy the sauna. In the sauna, in the buff, getting toughened by flames. Once you've gone and taken sauna, life will never again be the same. Now if where we get sent reflects earthly time spent twixt the lake and the heat, then it's plain that those cloven foot fauna that dwell in the sun will return there again and again and again, again and again and again.
standing already I've been standing for half an hour is that signifying you're not doing what Sharon what did you ever see Dr. Nakin in the sauna I don't remember I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry sing the tune called C-SPAN Junkie. I'm a C-SPAN Junkie, I'm a C-SPAN Junkie. Yes, they called me a C-SPAN Junkie. Although no one has called me a C-SPAN Junkie to my face, I'm, I've called myself a C-SPAN Junkie, a C-SPAN Junkie, a C-SPAN Junkie. I'm so hooked to book information. I watch it nearly every weekend. I also love watching the professor talk class and classes on set Saturday evenings and on uh, and on uh, on on eleven at at eleven a.m. Uh, to midnight, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, and I love watching the uh, Senate and and uh, congressional hearings that are put on by uh, progressive, uh, progressively minded individuals. The only the only thing that will pull me away from that is if I'm going somewhere or if there's somebody that is neoliberal or, or is right wing. So other than that, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, I'm a C-SPAN junkie, and that's the way it goes. Thank you. 
twice because it's only really, uh, 55 seconds long. And I'm not going to catch it the first time. Um, the practice of love. What do I call my dead twin, the one who died in my mother's womb, the one who never saw light of day, stillborn, mistaken, unfit to live? I call him brother. He sits in the woods nearby. When I go to him, he tells me, good job, you're doing great. <laughs> and he smiles. Some uh, times he sleeps because we all need rest. Sometimes he sings with the birds. Sometimes he gives me oddities he found while walking. I collect them in a basket and give them to my wife for my daughter's dowry. I'm going to read it again because it's kind of just the practice of love. What do I call my dead twin, the one who died in my mother's womb, the one who never saw light of day, stillborn, mistaken, unfit to live? I call him brother. He sits in the woods nearby. When I go to him, he tells me, good job, you're doing great, and he smiles. Sometimes he sleeps because we all need rest. Sometimes he sings with birds. Sometimes he gives me on the keys he found while walking. I collect them in a basket and give them to my wife for my daughter's dowry. I so know we've had a pandemic happening, and in Elgin there's a poetry group, and some of the poets responded uh, to, the, to the pandemic in various different ways. One of the poems is actually mine, and one of them is half mine, and the other two poems are actually poems of people in my poetry circle. And this one is by Robin Miguel, and it's called Blooming in Place. Really? I'm usually such a loud one. Okay, is that better? Can you actually hear me? No. This is this is this happened after the first wave of the pandemic left us. Blooming in place. The garden knows no pandemic, but maybe the pandemic knows the garden. For it seems to have waited until that just right moment to show up climbing its appearance with the snowdrop and reaching its height during the reign of the daffodil. My gratitude explodes when I look out the window, for the garden reminds me of reality, and that is, pandemics will come and go, but blooming is forever. And, oh, I forgot. Hang on again. I forgot which one I picked. They go by numbers, otherwise I'll spend forever scrolling. That was Blooming in Place. The next one is actually mine, and it's number six. Bear with me while I do the techni technical, technical thing. Okay, this is, called the coming, this is called The Coming of a New Season, and it's actually what happened, because um, I hadn't worn clothes, I mean, I hadn't worn nice clothes. <laughs> All the Zoom, I kind of dressed from the waist up, so I hadn't looked in my closet for a while. So it's called The Coming of a New Season. I touched my spring clothes this morning, the pink sweater set that hung pressed against the tan. The underneath was short sleeve, a cardigan atop if March winds should blow. A skirt of yellow dotted Swiss, forgotten about but born again like the sound of music, and worn again. A rerun paired with, uh, are those shorts or pedal pushers? And will people soon be pedaling? down lanes, and will we hold hands, those of us left to couple and walk two abreast, hardly inches apart, along paths of hope. I touched my spring clothes this morning, the white filmy blouse I had on the day the virus took my Angeline.
scroll again. We've got number 11. And this one, I was actually traveling with a poetess named Barbara. And um, she wrote most of it. Every now and then she did this collaborative thing where she looked at me and asked, was this the right, looked at me and asked, was this the right word? But we were on the same Amtrak. We were going the same way, we were going out of, out of Chicago to, uh, to the uh, St. Paul Depot. It's called Traveling by Train. <sighs> Traveling by train along the gray river, we passed intermittent trees, black branches fringed with snow. As the day lightened, water ripples reflected buildings along the banks and vapor rose to meet the rain. In one tree up ahead, a dark mound filled the upper branches, perhaps an abandoned nest left over from last spring. Then a white patch widened at one end. It grew larger, lengthened, and curved upward until a bald eagle unfurled complete. As we flashed by, the eagle took off and soared with wingspan broader than human height in silhouette against the brightening sky. <laughs> and lastly, number 39. It'll take me a second to scroll to that number. I think that, tra uh, that train ride, by the way, was one of the first train rides when we got unscared of, you know, traveling on a train. Uh, <clears throat> and we did actually see him. Uh, you're a great audience. You're being so quiet. I mean, I'm, I mean, really, it's really, really cool. I'm almost there. <laughs> I mean, you're all getting bitten. I hope you have a lot of bug spray on and all that. You know, I got bare sleeves and everything. And no bug spray. Me neither. Well, at least you have long sleeves. This is the last one, and uh, it's called it's called it's called Frank at Joy's, December 2020. He's lost his mind. It's the last hurrah. There's not much to do to call it back. I wait for the moment a wind blows away the cobwebs, the ganglia and mitochondria webs that have torn or are in tatters. His love matters. He totters. There's no more walking. Striding has been long gone. The crossword puzzles are squares to him. What are these numbers for? His mind is gone. Lost down a path only he can go. Help me, he says in his sleep. In a dream, he says, Hail Mary, full of grace. This is a safe place, this place I have him in, my house. I try not to lose my own mind in sadness, to fears of what might be ahead for all of us. I do not want him to suffer. I answer non sequiturs, questions out of sync. He understands food, and we communicate that way. A minor victory today. He took his pills. He let me put the drops in his eyes. If glaucoma took hold, he'd be blind to me, his most devoted lifeline. Thank you very much, Joy. You're welcome, darling. I'm going to go back into my alter ego and give this wonderful laurel or scarf back, or schmata. Next up, Shaw Robinson. Woohoo! Really, really excellent fancy out. It has a total of five strings. String number one, string number two, string number three, and string four and five. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the banjo is round at the bottom and has a uh, fingerboard. <laughs> this is just in case I get nervous and forget what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm wondering, maybe I should use the mic for my voice. Yeah. Yeah. Raise it a little bit. Sure. That's probably good. <laughs> 
to go to the memorial. One of the things that we're going to do tonight is to just uh, talk a little bit about Ralph, to show some pictures, um, and then for you to share if there are special memories, special encounters, special wisdom that Ralph provided for all of us. Um, he was certainly at more people camps than anyone around here. Uh, he was someone who had more insight, although he had lost his vision in a plane crash uh, in a small plane when he was 17. He married Kay, they had four kids. Ralph was involved in all kinds of social justice 
efforts, whether it was with the Friends community, whether it was with Sanctuary, whether it was their caring for foster kids in their home and other, other people in their home, um, School of Americas, it, it would be impossible to include all of the things that Ralph was involved with. Um, and so we're going to show some pictures, and again, we'd like some of you to share some of those moments that really made a difference for you um, in the, the joy and the experience that we had with Ralph, and some of you also had the experience with Kay. I was very lucky with my daughter and granddaughter to have been able to visit them a couple weeks before he died. And then, of course, later, Kay died. And it was the same person with great humor and great um, kindness. And we hope that uh, you will, especially those of you who knew him, will be reminded. And those of you who didn't get that opportunity will come to appreciate that just the, the marvelous experience that so many of us had. Thank you. Phil's, Phil's going to set up, we'll start while he sets up the, the projector. And what we're showing is the last two thirds of the 15 minute um, uh, slideshow. It's a, it's a video, but it was a slideshow at the um, memorial service at Friends School a couple weeks ago. Um, the first, we're going to start with the people camp pictures that I sent David to include in the slideshow, so it be people camp and whatever they had in the show afterwards. Um, as far as I wanted to share um, one of my memories of Ralph, um, he was very involved in the start of both FMBW and People Camp when he was in his 40s. And um, he was, the, well, we were at Camp Mishawaka for almost 30 years when I got the phone call um, in, I think it was in December, saying that we weren't going to be able to continue at Mishawaka. And just like this place, for those of you who've been coming here now for 15 years, Mishawaka was very dear to our hearts. It was home, the home that we came to at People Camp every August. And so it was just really a shock. To, um, and they had scheduling, you know, regular camp. But um, I, one thing that really worried me was Ralph was now in his 70s. How was he going to adjust to a new camp as a blind person with lots of, you know, we hadn't found a camp yet. Um, so I was just feeling like, this is going to be the end of Ralph being a camp, and that can't happen. That's not going to happen. Um, so he was the first, other than Phil, he was the first person I called to tell about it. I thought about it a couple days before I called him. And when I told Ralph, he said, well, let's find a new camp. And I was just so, so relieved <laughs> and just felt like if Ralph can help us find, if Ralph has that attitude, you know, we're going to find a new camp. I'm going to learn my way around. Um, the rest of us could figure it out too. And it just gave us the, the courage to just go move on and find a new camp, which is here. Um, does anyone else want to come up and say more or less what you remember? And Phil will, the, 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 that thing will start when it gets up. <laughs> well, no story. Uh, I was thinking about people that didn't ever meet Ralph, and I met him when I was a little kid. I was probably Julian's age or something like that. And I met him at camp. Actually, I met him around meeting in other places too, but really got to know him at camp. And I was, I was a little bit, I didn't know, you know, as a kid, I didn't know what to think. He was the only person I ever met who was blind at that age. And, uh, but he was just such an extraordinary person. You could, you, there was no limit with him. And the thing that I was thinking about was a few years later, my dad, we were moving something or doing some kind of construction work, and we were going to go get Ralph's van. And Ralph had this old van, and 
And so we're going to his house, and I was, you know, a few years older, but still pretty young. And I was thinking, why does Ralph have a man he's blind? <laughs> and uh, we get there, and I'm looking around his house, and I've been to his house. I was like, oh, this is really interesting, all this stuff's happening. And we're going to get in the van, and I start thinking, is Ralph going to drive this van? <laughs> and I'm starting to get worried. I was like, how's this going to work? Is it, you know, is this... But, it, you know, as a nine-year-old or in that area age or something, I really thought it was possible. <laughs> and so, of course, he didn't drive van. But uh, for those of you who didn't meet Ralph, I think that's a good way to think about him. <laughs> By the way, that was one of his sons and granddaughters. And his wife, Kay. Anybody else? And earlier on, it was Lois's son and Julian's dad, Julian and Dylan's dad, Zach. Some of these pictures are from De Kay, from Demi and Lois. Yeah, um, I guess I feel like we just have to talk about Ralph and Potts. Yeah. That was where I said, Ralph, he, after every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Ralph went into the kitchen and he scrubbed Potts. And he just kind of held court. He was just um, the friendliest person. It made the kitchen really fun and very appealing. And it, he really, to me, um, I don't know, he made people camp really appealing. He was a person who was so welcoming and so kind. And he always recognized me by my voice, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> and um, I think everybody who did dishes after the meals really looked forward to spending a little time with Ralph. Ralph was here, you guys wouldn't have to he <laughs> taught me how to do pots with my eyes closed. Use your fingers. You, know, you can look at a pot and you, you think it's clean, but until you shut your eyes, feel around the pot that you really missed something. So, I had the pleasure of, of traveling up to camp frequently with Ralph um, because the van was also what we loaded up all the, the equipment, all the, the yeah. So for camp and all the food, you know, everything with that. So, um, and by the way, Ralph maintained that van on his own, right? Uh, so he had a, a, a real knack for tools. He knew how to use them uh, and never lost that despite he lost, losing his eyesight. Uh, the other thing he didn't lose um, as a pilot is that aerial perspective, that map and perspective on the world. And so you could continue to talk about Ralph and say, well, you know, we're... We're coming to such and such, you know, Little Falls. He said, oh, yeah, that's where Lindbergh grew up. And then, you know, you know, say, oh, yeah, I know. Just up that road there is where you get to go off to Foley. And, and he could immediately orient himself in any map you, you were talking about as you were driving along. Um, it was amazing to be able to, to have his map perspective on things um, that he was... Would, would know right where you were when you said, I'm turning here, I'm turning there, and he'd comment on it. Uh, he, um, 
he earned his keep as a counselor for the blind. And so a lot of very innovative work. And uh, one of the things that, that delighted me about Ralph is he tweaked the fact that to us tabs, you know the word tab, temporarily able-bodied. Um, and one of the ways that Ralph did that was he would say, <clears throat> You know, well, I, I, you know, I, I see that uh, that the weather's finally changing, and that that's changing the color of the trees. You know, or you know, or I see, the, you know, that 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 they're gonna uh, finally, finally. I see that Aid Mill Road is finally patched. You know, that's gonna be a lot better traveling on that, isn't it? Isn't that such a mess when you're trying to drive in, and it's so rough dodging those potholes? And he always did that. Just tweaked using the expression "I see." He had to squeeze it in. To at least every paragraph, <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of the things stories he told, he told Ralph, of course, could regale you with many, many stories. But one of the ones that, that particularly I found interesting was uh, Ralph worked the first about five years of his his work. He and Kay were in West Virginia, um, and he was there. Uh, in 1960, during the presidential primary, and one of the contenders in the presidential primary who ultimately lost to John Kennedy was Hubert Humphrey. And so Humphrey was on the road, and Humphrey was uh, on the road in West Virginia, and in the middle of a crowd, uh, you know, as, as Hubert is glad-handing all these people, he comes up to Ralph, he says, Hi, Ralph, nice to see you, how you doing? <laughs> and Ralph always talked about that. Said, Humphrey had this amazing memory of her, of her faces and names, which may have been true, but Ralph would be someone that would be very distinctive and easy to see. So it's a, it was a, a double-sided story that he would tell. Oh, that's making solar ovens. They really made solar ovens. That was, uh, Ralph. Uh, that is so amazing how you could always say, I see. It was so how. You know, like, I'll take, I'll take one. I have one last thing. It's hard to believe. It's hard to it was, it was early on in my people camp adventure. It was early on in my people camp adventure. And we had a talent show, as we do. And he, Ralph was on the stage, and he was addressing everyone. And after some serious stuff, he actually started telling a, a story about, um, uh, well, he ended up saying, here's looking at you. And he took oh. his eye out. <laughs> the whole side. I, I mean, I wish I could remember verbatim the story, but it's like, shot the heck out of me. <laughs> Pop that thing back in. No, it was like, he stood there just slightly, you know, anyway. No, <laughs> gathering in 1973. He was there with John Martinson and two other individuals from, basically from AFSC, American Friends Service Committee. So I remember him, but not very well. But here's a song I wrote right about the same time. It could have been the same month, it could have been the same day. So here's a song I think you'll find easy to sing along with. I sang this two years ago at the talent show, and it got requested by somebody who remembered it. So here it is. It's called Come Alive. And it goes like this. Come 
tonight We are the revolution of the night We are the revolution And everything is coming Yes, everything is going all right Let's try it again We are the revolution of a lie. We are the revolution and everything is coming. Yes, everything is going all right. Now the verse is gold. We need some spirit. We are the spirit. guitar player, singer, in a cafe, and um, around a campfire, and um, I didn't write it. I'll tell you who wrote it after I read it. It's someone you know. It's called Just Half of That Big Blue Moon. Half 
moon. We're all gathered here to listen. Music is great when heard. The old songs, chairs, tables, souls. Voices bring out notes, feelings, memories, friends. So does the wood. 9 to 11 gauge strings ring. Sitka tops, mahogany sides sing, and those classical notes. People come and go, asking for favors and dues, getting nothing but pleasures and poses. The cold air, the warm souls, walking around, feeling nothing, but all those campfire coals. Inspiration opens doors. The best flavors bring out the floors. Everything is everyone when you sing. Thanks. Karen, you know who wrote that? It was you. And she gave it to me years ago. It's a perfect going away song. It's called I'm Going. Or Woe Ya Ya. And it's about going into some place we don't really know, not sure, but it's going to be hard. And we're going to get through it. Even if it's hard and even if it makes us cry, we're still going to get there. Yep. Yeah. Here, here. Oh. All right. Should we say the words first? We are going. Heaven knows where we are going. We know within. We know within. It's a little different than that book, so. Yeah. 